Hey, wanted to let you know, um, sadly, that we had uh, a saint of God in our midst. One of our church family um, went to heaven this past week, Ronnie Dodson, who many of you know because Ronnie has been with us almost from the beginning of our church, has struggled in health as long as he's lived, and um, those struggles deepened this year um, to the point that... that um, that he transitioned to heaven uh, last week. And so uh, I wanted to let you know on a practical note that uh, we'll have a service celebrating Ronnie's life. And insofar as the word of God makes clear that to be absent from the body is to be present from the Lord and that we will not die, but we will all be changed. Um, there's much to celebrate. And for somebody who has suffered uh, as much as he has for him to be free, uh, is a delight indeed. And, and in case you, you're, you're not placing name and face, Ronnie sat right down here, both services, just about every Sunday. The last year, he's been in a wheelchair, um, and uh, you know he'd be the one that, even if I wasn't preaching very good, he'd be like, amen, pastor. That's good. And <laughs> always, <laughs> I would call Ronnie on low self-esteem days. Uh, you know, always, <laughs> and and uh, I, I share this also because over the years, uh, of investing so much of my heart in, in serving and caring for him as he's walked through just so much suffering, um, it, he became a genuine friend, and, uh, and it, it hit me a little hard. Uh, and several of you have shared that this morning as well who hadn't heard before, before I mentioned it in the first service. Um, and so Thursday at 11, we'll have a memorial service here celebrating Ronnie's life, and then a, a lunch reception afterward. Uh, where we'll, we'll remember him and, and host his family who are coming in from out of town, which is a bit of a big deal as there ha has been some division there. So grateful for the opportunity to do that. Uh, I've been reflecting on Ronnie's life, and it, it's apropos in a way that this reflection has occurred on the week that we're looking at the spiritual discipline of studying the Word of God. And because I, I know no man who built his life more fully on the truth of God's Word. Ronnie suffered more than anyone I know, and I don't know why. It was the hardest question to talk about with him. Um, and yet, what's amazing is that he never once took the place of a victim, though in truth, unlike most of us who sometimes go victim, he really was uh, of so many different uh, things, ailments, circumstances, heartbreaks, um, abuses, and, and yet... Somewhere along the line, uh, it, it became his way to, to build his life on God's truth. And Ronnie, uh, up until most recently this fall, and well, up until last week, you know, when I was speaking to him, but this fall he was finally released from the hospital after having his foot amputated because um, doctors were not able to control the infection that was um, facilitated or, or furthered by his diabetes. Uh, so he had to wait for it to heal up before they could put the socket for the prosthetic leg, which he never had the opportunity to learn to walk on. And so he was in a wheelchair. And he'd just gotten out of the hospital the day before, was crossing Broadway in his wheelchair, just lived down there at Broadway and 5th by Moe's Barbecue, and, uh, and was hit by a car. And he called me, and he was back, at, was back in the hospital. And the godliest of us would be like, what else? Could happen. What the heck? And uh, I asked him, you know, how are you holding up? And he said, well, the word of God says that, and he went on to quote some Bible verse in the King James that he had learned long ago. And, um, and that's just how he was. You know, his body by the end was pretty broken, um, but not his heart. His heart was built on something solid. We began this series entitled Begin, in which, as Pastor George mentioned, we have looked at a spiritual discipline or a practice of faith each week, as is our custom to start the year, at a time when it's sort of open enrollment window for many of us in life for new rhythms, reevaluating priorities, and establishing new ones. Well, we kick the series off looking at how we as humans live from the inside out, how we live from our hearts, the way the Bible puts it. And how our hearts have been formed over the course of living by a variety of factors and how they can be reformed. And so our challenge this morning 
Begin letting the word of God reform your heart. That's the challenge. Begin, if you're willing this year, as a new practice or the resuming of an old one, perhaps, to let the word of God reform your heart. We respond in times of challenge not from our mind, not from our ideas or good intentions, not from our highest ideals. We respond from our hearts. We live, as Dallas Willard famously put it, from our depths, most of which we don't even understand. Many of us like to believe that we live by our higher notions. We post things on Instagram and um, by signs of pithy sayings, printed on wood that was weathered to look like it came off of an old barn in Vermont. And stenciled on there are things that we subscribe to and wish to be true. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. But that's not where most of us live from. We live from our hearts. We live from what's been packed down and formed around them. When the pressure is on... The way it works for us humans is that what's in us is what's coming out of us. And this was true of Jesus as well. Our text this morning is a story about Jesus' life, and it's one of particular interest to me because it's so curious. It's so interesting on a number of levels. It's one that you may be familiar with. Matthew chapter 4 is where we'll start. The Bible says Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. This was just after Jesus had stepped out of 30 years of relative obscurity to be baptized at the River Jordan by John the Baptist, his cousin, and then the Spirit of God descends on him in a way that was evident to those who are around him. And this was kind of his coming out party. So his ministry was to begin. But before he started preaching around Galilee, this happens. For 40 days and 40 nights, he fasted and became very hungry. And this verse, I always feel a little nervous because involuntarily when I read it, I chuckle. Because you'd have to agree is one of the more (laughs) self-evident truths in Scripture. (laughs) However, the point I think it's making is that Jesus didn't get some God cheat code. Like, he also got hungry when he didn't eat. Scripture says that in the being in very nature God, he didn't consider equality with God as something to be grasped. It was there, like the override handle. He just didn't grasp it. And I get that because the last two weeks I've been eating vegetables, a lot of them. And it's not as though I lost the capacity for cheeseburgers. It's just that they were there and I didn't consider them as something to be grasped. But I wanted to grasp one numerous times. And that's how Jesus was. He was hungry, right? Because he was a man. During that time, the devil came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, no, the scriptures say people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now, there are two key insights, I believe, in this passage, and I want to draw them out quickly, and then we're going to spend the bulk of our time on practicals this morning. First, it's, it's how Jesus responded. Here and two more instances, all three times the devil tempts him, Jesus responds the same way, no. The scriptures say. And see, what this shows us is Jesus is just like you and me. He too lives out of his heart because he's a human. And what's been put in him and pressed down and formed around his heart, that's what comes out of him in his weakest and most significant moments to date. It reveals what Jesus had prioritized in his younger years. And we see in him what's true of us as well. What's formed in us is what comes out of us when we're in the press. So if you want to know what sort of formation has happened around your heart, take a quick look in your back pages at how you respond under pressure or in moments of significance. Luke 6, Jesus said, the good man, this is gender inclusive so you could read person, brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For out of the overflow of his heart, 
His mouth speaks. His life lives. It's what's in us that comes out of us, not what we wish to be true of us or what we subscribe to from afar. We like to think it is our ideals and our nobler thoughts that define us, you know, our Instagram posts and weathered wood signs in the kitchen. But in fact, they're not only not the core of us, they tend to fall by the wayside in crunch time. Just think about the way people respond in times of duress. Remember, we watched it for about a year on TV after 9-11, how different random citizens caught in that unfortunate moment responded. Some freaked out, and the news loved to play that over and over. People freaking out like aliens are invading or the world is ending, and it makes sense why, right? It was scary, and, but screaming and carrying on and running. And others who weren't first responders, you know, they were in a suit. They took off their coat, dropped their briefcase, and against probably their better judgment, if they had time to think about it, ran into those burning buildings and helped rescue people. And the question I want to look at this morning is why? Why does each do what he or she does? How do you respond under pressure? For some, it's heroism and clear thinking. For others, it's fear, self-preservation, or panic. So the question I think that this passage asks of us is, what is stored up in your heart? I told you I think there's two key insights in this passage, in this story about Jesus. The second has to do not with how Jesus responded in some, but with what specifically he replied with. Jesus told the devil, no, the scriptures say, people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. People live by The word of God. What exactly does that mean, to live by the word of God? I think the point Jesus is illuminating is made throughout the history of God's covenant community and throughout his scripture revelation as well. And that is that we were made for God's word to fill our hearts. We as humans were made for God's word to fill our hearts. Jesus is quoting Moses here about the manna when he was leading the people of Israel through the Sinai desert after liberating them from 400 years of slavery in Egypt. And they got to ransack the people of Egypt on the way out. They somehow miraculously didn't guard their cupboards and the people got to raid them and and had their backpacks full of stuff. But eventually the provisions start to wear out and the people are getting nervous. God had said, hey, I'm going to be your God. You're going to be my people. We're going to live in covenant relationship and I'm going to provide for you. But they didn't really take that to heart evidently because when the stores of food grew thin, they started grumbling and complaining, right? Living out of their depths. Makes sense. They'd been slaves for 400 years. They didn't know necessarily where their next meal was coming from. And so God doesn't lead them to another town like Egypt where similarly the people turned a blind eye while they pillaged their pantries again. Instead, God gives them literally bread from heaven that resembles nothing. The word for it, manna, is a transliteration of the Hebrew phrase which simply means, what is it? That's what it's called. Manna is, they called it, what is it? Because everyone was like, what is it? It fell overnight from heaven. And the reason Moses had explained to them that God did it that way was that, listen, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so God wanted them to get that plain and clear. That's what Jesus was quoting in responding to the enemy that day. We're made for God's will, God's word rather, to fill our hearts. We need the word of God. We live by it. We need it like we need food and water and oxygen. So I, um, we live in a 120 year old house um, here in South Denver. And what you get in, in old houses, mostly in South Denver, is small lots and yards with big trees. And I am like a second generation child of the suburbs and I spent the first portion of my life living on big lots with small trees. And so what you get when you live in a suburban community off a cul-de-sac where there are big lots and small trees is your trees are held up by sticks 
because they were planted a few years ago. You know, and the wind blows, you don't want them to, like, the root ball to come up. Uh, but your yard's perfect. And so you do that thing we do where you mow it on Saturday morning, and, and you do it too. You want the lines to be impossibly straight. And if one gets a little sideways, you redo it. And then you say hi to your neighbor when he's mowing his lawn. But you're not even, like, making pretense over the fact that you're not making eye contact because each of you is judging one another's lawn. <laughs> right? You know what I'm talking about? And you're like, dang, he's already got edged. And you're like, break out the edger. And there's that, that, um, that place where, as a suburbanite, I um, found my identity and value partially in how green and full my lawn was. Anyone else? Am I going to own that? You're like, no, we don't care about it. Yes, you do. You totally care about it. And you, don't, you hate it when your neighbor's lawn is greener and fuller than yours. Well, here's what you get in the city. My lawn's a little, a little thin. It's like you can't even get the tire mark lines because there's not enough blades to show it. It's a little thin, and it drives me nuts because my suburban soul wants it thick and green and feels like your judgment toward me, right, <laughs> when you come to my house. And so, but I have big trees, and so I, I try, I like fertilize the heck out of the thing. I get it aerated. I, mean, I aerated it so much that there was hardly any soil left. It's like, it must be that the water's not getting down in there. It needs more fertilizer. I blamed, I judged, I judged, and he judged, judged the last owner. I was like, this guy didn't do anything with his yard. Now I'm, I'm paying for it. I, I, except it didn't get any better over a year. And so finally I, I called the landscaper when he was there doing other stuff. I'm like, bro, what's going on? I was like embarrassed. I'm like, you know, in hushed tones. What's going on with my yard, man? It's like, it's like not thriving and he's like, well, you got big trees. I'm like, I know I got big trees, but what's going on in my yard? And he's like, no, I mean, they, there's, there's too much shade. And I'm like, isn't that okay? Like, I mean, there's, he's like, you're not getting enough sunlight. I'm like, the sun's right there. He's like, yeah, but the lawn is getting blocked by the tree because you have a big tree and a small lawn. And I was like, how does that matter? And he said, well, your yard does not live by fertilizer alone. <laughs> so you're like, where's this going? Ha <laughs> ha, I brought it back. You're like, you're too far into this metaphor. <laughs> that was therapeutic. I'm not going to lie. However, here's the point. Your yard does not live by fertilizer and water alone, but by every photon of light that proceeds from the sun. You're like my yard. You can live with food and water. Like your heart will keep beating and you'll keep breathing, but you can't fully live because your soul was made to thrive when it's filled with the word of God. Jesus said, I'm the vine and you're the branches. So abide in me. Do you know what that word abide means? Live. Like lay down roots, plant yourself in me, abide in me. And he says, if you abide in me, and we've talked about that a lot, living with Jesus, right? If you abide in me and listen, my word abides in you. You will bear much fruit, but apart from me, you could do nothing. You're going to be a thin, scraggly yard. If, you're, if my word abides, lives, takes root and dwells in you. Here's how Paul said it. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. So that's all well and good, but I think that there is a question that intellectually honest, humble-minded students of the Bible ought to ask. And that is, how could that exactly be? How could written words be powerful like that? I mean, that sounds good, but how does that practically work? Well, here's the thing. These are no mere written words. Hebrews says the word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. It's the power of God for full, thriving lives. It's just that God knows we can't appropriate his power in these earthen vessels. And so he like takes the power of God and condenses it into a small, easy to swallow capsule, like words on a page that we know how to take in. We know how to interact with. And so the word of God is alive. Have you ever read God's word and you're like, man, it's like it leapt off the page. I had read that 10 times before or I'd never heard this, but it was like it was just for me. It's because it is. It lives. John in his gospel says, in the beginning was the word. 
and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And John's like Captain Metaphor, where, you know, Luke's very literal, John uses imagery. But the imagery he chooses here for Jesus, and that's who he's talking about, right, is the Word of God. Interesting and confusing that he likens God's Son, his ultimate revelation, to his Word, the next best thing. See, Jesus and the Bible together are God's living revelation. In a way, the Bible is kind of like Jesus in written form. And so in sum, here's what we know from this little story. One, Jesus clearly knew the paramount importance of God's truth to the human soul. And two, he had long since stashed it away and let it form his heart. Because what was in him is what came out of him when he was in the press. And that sets an example for us, just like the rest of Jesus' life. An example about how we were made to live and to thrive. So then the question is, how do we get there? And that's where I want to turn our attention here to practicals. Proverbs 4 says, my child, imagine this is God speaking to you through his word, right? In Proverbs, my child, pay attention to what I say. Listen carefully to my words. Don't lose sight of them. And listen, let them penetrate deep into your heart. For they bring life to those who find them. Man does not live by bread alone. The word of God brings life. But not merely by reading it. Not by passively interacting with it. It says, let it penetrate deep down into your heart. And all of us who have ever sat through a class of high school or college or graduate school know how not to let written words penetrate our heart. It's a skill that we learn, right? We know how to have them go into our minds and then remember them for the test, hopefully, and then they're gone. Hopefully we learned how to learn. That's what we tell ourselves to justify the fact that we're in our 40s and still paying student loans. But we know what it feels like not to do this, right? To have it go through our minds. What he's saying is, not that. Let the word of God not go in our minds and then out. It's not an intellectual exercise. Let it not be something that we get together and, and pontificate over as an excuse not to take it in, but rather purpose for it to penetrate. Let it seep down into our hearts. Let it marinate our hearts. Let it reform them. And so the action step here is just that, to find a way to live as we start our year beginning, hopefully some new and intentional practices that purpose is for God's truth to penetrate your heart. I would say this does not happen passively. It doesn't happen by Christian osmosis. We're talking here about God's word sculpting your inner being. That takes intentionality. It takes some sacrifice. It's not likely to happen simply by attending church sometimes and reading the verse of the day when it pops up on your phone. Joshua chapter 1, he gives these instructions to his people. Be strong and courageous and says, study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night, so you, you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. Because listen, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so then you'll thrive, you'll prosper, you'll succeed in all you do. And this is a great application passage. We're going to tear it apart for just a minute. First, he says, study this book of instruction continually. Study it continually. So let me offer as a first practical, and we'll unpack it, invest yourself in studying the Bible every day. Invest yourself in studying the Bible every day. If we want to dissect this challenge, start here. What does that look like? Well, let's break it down. Pick a time and place that it can become a routine. It's a good place to start. For me, that's in the morning on my couch with a blanket and a cup of coffee. That's how I like it. That's when it works for me. Now, do I ever 
interact with the word of God not then? Sure. And do I ever not interact with the word of God then? Of course. But that's kind of my routine. And you're like, yeah, but you know what? I, I'm more just sort of free form. I, 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 my life, I'm busy, man. And so I fit it in where it can. But here's the thing about that. I'm not judging you. I'm just holding a mirror up. My experience, tell me if this resonates, has been that the stuff that I fit in where I can is not the, the inner circle priorities. It ends up being, whether I mean for it to or not, the outer circle priorities. Like, I love to ski. I have a season pass. And yet, I fit it in where I can. Because I have a family, and I have a job, and I have all of you whom I love, and I have a yard that I have to take care of and try to get to grow, <laughs> which is going to be thick and lush before I die if it kills me, right? And so I fit in skiing where I can, much as I enjoy it. I would like to believe it is, it is a really high priority, but in fact, it's a lower priority. And many of us fit in reading the Bible where we can. And what I'm telling you is that, be honest, that's what that means to your priority. So pick a time and place that can become a routine. Because when we pick a time and a place, that's what turns it into a habit and habits become disciplines. And then once you do that, let me challenge you here. Aim to read, uh, to start with anyway, a chapter a day. You're like, bro, I read like seven chapters a day. Well, all righty then, get on with your Jedi Bible reading self. That's awesome. I'm just saying that's good. I'm saying if you're the verse, of de- verse a day person, aim to read a chapter a day. It'll take you 15 minutes to really interact with it, 20 minutes. You could spend 30 minutes in it, right? Uh, a chapter a day. And when you do that, read it in context. And so rather than the... Um, whatever I open to method or what am I feeling today or, or what popped up on my app uh, as the verse of the day and go in there and maybe I'll read that, that chapter. You know, it says read more. Maybe I'll click on that because here's what that does. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying it's less likely to penetrate your heart because when we read that way, um, I think we do a little more of the social media than the word of penetrating of the heart, right? Because you're like, I have a verse. You're like, oh, that verse is good. And just when you're like getting to the, ooh, that's good, you're like, that would look good with frosted trees behind it. So let's try that one. <laughs> no, no, the mountain, the like Sunset Mountain scene. Yeah, but it's about community. So no, the circle in the sand with the heart holding hands. Let's do it on that one. Yeah, that's good. Okay, post. Oh man, it doesn't, it's, it's supposed to post straight from the Bible app, but it never does on this one social media. So I got to drag it and cut it on screenshot. Okay, I got to crop it, but put the filter on, right? And then rotate it ever so slightly because why do we do that? I don't know. And then post it. And they're like, okay, that verse, it was so good. But oh, she likes it. He, he likes it too. It's good because it's good, right? They like it. Hey, they like my Bible reading. So do they. Oh, he's not my friend, but he wants to be. Okay. And now that's not Bible reading. It's social media. And I would say plan a separate time for that, but the separate time for that is called the rest of your life when we do it. So what I'm suggesting, and maybe this is old school, but hey, let me be old school. Take your phone somewhere else. Do that thing if you're a parent of teenagers or preteens that you do with your kids where you're like, park the phone, kids. Well, park the phone, Rob, and leave it somewhere else and use an old school Bible because you're likely to read it more. And then read it in context. Study through a book at a time, right? So I'm going to do, say, Mark, 16 chapters. So that's going to be 16 days or 16 days of reading because there's a few days I'm not going to probably get to it. And then if you're in Isaiah and it's like 66 chapters, okay, well, read like 10 of them and then bookmark it and go read Philippians and then come back. But if you read it in context, you're going to find that it, 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 it's able to penetrate more. And just for now, trust me in that. And then when you read it, interact with it, engage it, mark it up. My routine is I read my Bible with a highlighter and a ballpoint pen because there's some stuff I like to highlight and then there's some stuff I like to underline. I have my own convention. I make little notes in the margins, right, with the pen. Um, and, and, and so what that means is you probably want to get a Bible that you can write in without feeling guilty or desecrating it, right? Which means the, the $75 calfskin leather one that your mom got you probably isn't the best because the pages are super thin and you're like, oh, I tore it. Dang! Now, like, Philippians 3 is going to have a tear in it forever. And, and I feel bad, like, my grandmother would roll over in her grave if she knew I was. The pages are, like, gold embossed, you know, on the edges, and it's got your name on the front. So what I would say is put that one back in the shrine 
They're like, what shrine? You know the shrine. The shrine with the framed picture of footprints in the sand and the candle that your mom gave you that smells like frankincense. You're like religion shrine. That when you went in your little stage of rebellion, you kept the religion shrine to tell yourself, I still believe, I'm just exploring. <laughs> I didn't leave the church. The church left me. Shrine. Yeah, that shrine. You know what I'm, I only got a little bit of time. Ooh, sorry, did that hit close? You know the shrine I'm talking about? So leave the calfskin version in that shrine and get a cheap Bible with thick paper, right? You're like, but I want the one with the mar notes in the margins. That's good. Just don't major on the notes. Major on the Bible because that's inspired. And then let the notes help. But start with the Bible and the Holy Spirit, okay? And if there's so many notes that there's no margin, then you can't write stuff. So a little bit of margin. You know, I say, by and large, the cheaper the better. Like these, how much do these cost us? Like Lindsay, are they like two bucks? Four, three. Okay, so these are cheap. But the pages, like there's a little girth to that, right? There's a little, there's a little thickness. And you can write on it and not feel like anyone's going to roll over in their grave. Is that all right? Like, I mean, it's too practical? All right, so here's the thing. What do you do? Well, what do you write? Well, I would say make notes of the stuff, highlight the stuff that stands out to you. You're like, oh, man, that like, it's like that was written for me or whatever. Highlight it and then finish reading the chapter or the stuff that's totally confusing. You're like, what could that mean? I don't get it at all. Maybe you use a different color if you're that kid that like color codes your, your you know, notes. Um, and then here's what to do. If you get to one that you totally don't get it and it's like a contradiction, you know, you're like, well, that's the opposite of what that said. What the heck? Here's the thing. Um, George told me recently that God's given him a kind of an anointing for the Bible contradictions and confusing passages. So all you got to do is just put a little G by it and then and know that that's a George passage. And he said you could email him any time of the day or night or text him better, text him, and he'll get together with you and explain it, okay? So make notes of the confusing stuff and then highlight the, uh, the stuff that stands out. And then when you're done reading your chapter, that's why I say give it 15 or 30 minutes, go through and pray the highlighted stuff. Lord, it said, it said, uh, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. God, I realize that there's stuff in me, like my, my body, maybe my mouth, bless you, but there's stuff in me that's probably going the other direction. Help me to do that. So you just pray it. Then that, it solves the other problem of like the prayer sermon when you're like, yeah, but what do I do after five minutes? I prayed for everyone I know. You pray about the things you highlighted. And if it's the confusing stuff, prior to your meeting with George, ask God, what does that mean? Can you, can you bring uh, insight? The Bible says that your word gives insight to the, to the simple. Can you show me how this works? And then you'll be amazed at how the Holy Spirit causes light bulbs to come on over, over time, okay? All right, let's wrap this up. We have, um, if, if you've never really been able to make, oh, it just got really big. Stop, okay. If you've, if you've never uh, been able to make heads or tails out of the Bible and you're like, man, I tried reading it, but I started in my New Year's resolution and I got to, usually you get to about March and or Leviticus. And then... <laughs> What happens is you get really busy, right? Anyone ever get to Leviticus and get super busy and you're like, this is just, this is just torture. George also has a little bit of a, of a Levitical law anointing that you can ask him about <laughs> if you get stuck in Leviticus. But maybe, so here's what's true, and this is important to know. It took me a while to figure this out, so let me give you a little um, shortcut. The, the words of God are inspired. The order of the books is not. You don't have to read it in order for it to work. In fact, it might be your first go, better not to do that. And so Hillsong put together this word Bible. It's the New Testament organized in a different order. And it makes, it's designed to make it make, be the most accessible, make the most sense for your first time through. And so it's not like a picture Bible. It doesn't have like, you know, cartoons, pictures. It's for adults, but it's got some helpful notes and, and it's organized in a more sensible, readable way for your first time through. I would say come grab one, except the first service took all of them service. So, which is good. And I said, like, this isn't us like your, you know, the hot lunch program, your free Bible program. This is if you don't, have, don't know how to read the Bible or haven't gotten started and they cleaned them out, which is awesome, right? So we want first service people reading the Bible. Hopefully they're reading it. 
what that means is for you guys, we're going to order more. I think we already have more in order. Is that right, Lindsay? So we'll have them in the next few weeks. We'll let you know. And you can get started just reading a chapter a day in this. All right, let's wrap it up. Uh, meditate on it, it says, day and night. Meditate on it day and night. So this, the discipline there is practice meditating on God's word. What that means is first allow for some mystery and tension. Allow for it not all to make sense or be okay with not all the light bulbs coming on at once. That's part of the process of seeking and finding. It's when we seek with all of our heart. And sometimes God doesn't put the cookies all on the bottom shelf because he wants us to really seek. So allow for the mystery. And then linger on your highlights. We already talked about that. One way uh, that Mari does that and has taught our women to do that, that that I think is beautiful, is to keep a word journal, a journal that's dedicated for your reflections on your study of God's word. And in that, um, she asks two questions. What stood out in the reading today? What stood out in the reading today? And so maybe that's, what did you highlight? What is the Holy Spirit uh, revealing to you? And write it down. So take what you marked and then write it in the journal. And then secondly, how were you challenged to embrace what's true? See, now you're going from the intellectual exercise of trying to understand it and reading it to the spiritual process of meditating on it. And that's where it starts to penetrate your heart. Yeah? As a practical, um, I think it, it helps the penetrating of the heart to vary your media. So read, but also listen. That's where the, the app is super helpful because it gives you the audio Bible free. You can hook it into your Bluetooth in your car or just play it while you're brushing your teeth or whatever and, and listen to whole chapters of the Word of God. It's a different experience. It works with our brains and it gets into our heart in a, in a pretty powerful way. And then make what you're reading a go-to conversation. When you get together with a friend and you've talked about how each one's lives and jobs or kids or school is going or whatever, then talk about what's God showing you in his word. You would be surprised how that turbocharges friendship. And then share what God's showing you in, showing you in his word. Make it a go-to conversation. And of course, and this brings us to the end of our service, United Groups is a great context for that. Today is all about United Groups, so I want to leave plenty of time for you to, uh, to get to know the group leaders. Would you stand with me? I just want to read this blessing over you as we close. Would you just close your eyes and receive this blessing from the word of God? This is from Psalm 1. You know what? We do have one of these. It was the one I was using. Anyone want it? Anyone like, hey, I, don't, I haven't been able to make heads or tails if I get started. Okay, can you guys pass it back to him? I don't want to throw it. That's dangerous. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, man. I hope it is good. All right, just receive this blessing. Blessed is the person who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his or her delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season. And its leaf does not wither. And all that she does 